1985, when I switched from a high school that I truly, absolutely hated and ended up in what felt like a paradise, uh, Horace Greeley High School in Chappaqua, New York, I fell in with a group called the Quad Kids. I had the chance to reinvent myself, and where I wanted to be was with the weirdos and the artists and the thinkers. And then they congregated in this one weird little courtyard with a couple benches that was looked on by the library and a couple classrooms. They'd be playing chess or talking about philosophy and generally being weird. And one of the kids there was named David Mechner. And I didn't really know much about David or anyone else's home life. But over the years, I've come to know the Mechners a lot, and I thought I'd talk about the games that they play. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, William Hearn, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. David Mechner was brilliant. You sensed it when you talked to him. It was a crackling energy of somebody who could think on several levels, who was being kind and talking to you on yours. His jumps into the conversations we would have were always insightful, and they were always interesting. You forget sometimes that the people that you're dealing with are 15 years old, and we've convinced ourselves we know everything. But David seemed to really absorb knowledge faster than anyone I knew. He had a smile that just spread everywhere it went, and he had this really great look on his face when he was trying to process the frankly bizarre things that were coming out of my mouth at any given time. We didn't hang out socially much outside of high school. I do have a memory of one particular time we went and visited the Mechners at their home, and all I could do was be blown away by the architecture of their home. Try to imagine a huge O on the ground, and the center part has a dome, an actual glass covering, so that you could see the outside world, and the middle part of the home is kind of a garden. And I just thought, wow, to grow up in such an interesting, unique home, I just wondered what it must have been like. From 1985, when I first attended, till 1988, when I graduated, I'd hear about this and that, about David's brother, Jordan. Jordan had created a game that was extremely popular called Karataka. The idea that somebody, a single person, could create some sort of software that then would sell in the thousands and the tens of thousands and the hundreds of thousands, that was the true dream of any kid working on his own weird little projects on his machine and trying to justify to his parents why so much time was being spent on this thing. I didn't meet the legendary Jordan. He was living in California at that point. I was told that he was writing screenplays, and and I thought he should have another game. Uh, David and others mentioned he was working on something, some sort of Arabian Nights game that would be a kind of living movie, just like Karataka was. I had no idea what was going to come out of that, but eventually I did learn the name of this work in progress, and it was Prince of Persia. But before I talk about Prince of Persia, I want to talk about the game that David made that still, to this day, astounds me, both in the unique time at which it happened, the aspects of it that don't scale to today, and what it meant to me personally for one of my most intense memories of high school. The game was called Assassin. David didn't invent it. Uh, It was around for many years before that. It was a role-playing, a live-action role-playing game, you might say. And it was the kind of thing that comes from privilege. If you're lucky, you go to a school in which things are a little bit free, in which you are able to go between classes and then hang out or even have free periods or the ability to leave the school grounds, uh, be able to travel because you have a car. All of those aspects were important. Horace Greeley High School was a very, very fancy school. It had a lot of money going into it. The kids who were going there, they had a lot of money. It is absolutely true 
that in 1987, during the market crash, kids were lined up at the payphone in the school trying to get in touch with their brokers. For someone who had been suffering under a school that was completely locked down and really constricting in terms of what kids could do, it felt like heaven on earth for me, a true educational Valhalla. Because they had all of this funding, the school also was really insistent on having the best teachers. It was really hard to become a teacher there, and it was even harder to stay a teacher if you didn't live up to what they thought you were going to be. There were a lot of one-year teachers at Horace Greeley High School. In that environment of freedom and odd things and stuff going on, I was informed about a game. I saw flyers around the school inviting you to try out Assassin. Almost immediately, we get into the whiplash of how things were and how things are now. The idea of organizing and putting together a game, a game of any sort, especially one with lots of different players who don't know each other socially, that's not something you could just do in 1987. You probably had to be part of a group, whether it was a church group or Mensa or some sort of youth organization, to be able to organize games. The idea of putting something together that wasn't part of organized sports or organizations, that was rare. Of course, the name was intriguing, Assassin. And when I found out that David was behind it, I knew it was going to be special. And the anticipation of knowing that a big game was going to happen, something with dozens of players, and it was going to take place at the school, well, the endorphins were rushing. To enter the game, you had to provide David with a photo of yourself. David took your photo and assured you the day would come. Finally, the day came. David sat in the lunchroom with a pile of envelopes, and people went up to him, and pulling them out of his box, David would hand you an envelope with your name on it. Once you got the envelope, you walked away. You didn't want to be in the cafeteria when this happened. In the envelope is the photo of a person. That person is your target. You have to assassinate that person with a squirt gun. This means you better be carrying your squirt gun at all times. You can take all the time in the world to track down your target. But be aware, there's a target on your back as well. When you assassinate the person, you do so by squirting them with the squirt gun in a way that they are obviously wet from it. You cannot have witnesses. It can only be the target and the assassin. Once you've successfully soaked your target, your target hands you the envelope with your next target on it. At the end, it will be a single target and a single assassin chasing each other through a high school and beyond until one of them becomes the winner. This was mind-blowing. School's fun, and a school that you love being at is even more fun. But the idea that there was this quiet game going on in the background, the danger of being assassinated at any time, of not knowing who's your ally and who is your enemy, to find out that somebody has been tracking you, to be the hunter, the predator, watching somebody but trying not to nail yourself as being the assassin, and then finding that moment maybe around a corner in an area or in some way tricking them into isolation so you can win your bounty. What an incredible side quest in the world of being a teenager. I got my photo, my target, and I put it into my pocket. And from that point on, I had another thing to do with the school. The game, of course, started almost immediately. People hadn't quite internalized how to go around to different parts of the school and always ensure that they were within view of others. People were getting assassinated left and right. Because of the rules, you couldn't walk into somebody's classroom, shoot them in the face, and walk away. So that didn't happen. You didn't have people doing it where others could see it, like the cafeteria, so there weren't a whole lot of witnesses. In some ways, it was brilliantly designed to weave itself in and out of high school life. But people figured out how to do it. 
Your target might be walking out to their car in the student parking lot, and as they got in, you would just walk over, squirt them in the face, and get their target. Other people knew that with the hallways of the school, it was sometimes impossible not to get from one place to another and be alone. All it took was a minute or two of carelessness, and you were out of the game. My target was a friend of mine. A pretty good friend. He only attended Greeley for a short period of time. I'm not 100% comfortable giving his name. He deserves many other reasons to be known. Imagine a friend of yours being your assassination target. The opportunity is endless. You see him in your group of friends. You hang out with him. And for me, it was about the chase. I decided I would take my time. That week, word was coming in from all directions, uh, mostly from David giving updates of people dropping out of the assassination game. And my buddy and I would hang out and not really talk about the game, but say, yeah, we're doing our best, trying to find out where our target is, don't really know them, <laughs> you know, like friends do. Finally, opportunity came. We had gone to lunch together, hung out with people, and he was going to class. Coincidence had it that I was going in the same direction. And we were talking about the game. And at some point, he turns. And I'll always remember this moment. Because he turned slightly to look at me. And I guess I wasn't able to keep the look off my face. The look of somebody who everything has come together for. We were in a hallway that nobody else was in. And there wasn't anyone coming. And in my look, I guess I gave him the impression that I was not, for that very small moment, his buddy. He drew back. His eyes were as wide as anything I've ever seen. The fear was real. He starts stumbling inside of his jacket, trying to get to his squirt gun. Because one of the rules of assassin is that if you're able to shoot your assassin before they shoot you, you become their assassin and you're able to move on to the game with multiple targets. But his hand was stuck in the jacket as I smoothly reached into my own pocket and pulled out my weapon. I was able to squirt him right in the middle of the chest, no question, before his weapon was even drawn. And the look of betrayal, the look of sadness and elation and excitement, it was unique in my high school experience. We had both been playing this game. I was just playing one a little different than his. He sadly handed me his target picture. He uh, got over the adrenaline rush, and he told me I had played it very, very well. I did not win the assassin game. I did not win the assassin game. One night, my doorbell rang, I opened it to see who of my friends was visiting, and I was shot in the face. The kid who did it claimed that he had been alone, but I don't 100% believe him. But that's the kind of scrabbling around, the, the toehold searching that you do when you lose a game. Whether or not this was a fully legitimate hit, he'd gotten me. I'd gotten just what I deserved. I was out of the assassination game. As I understand it, it lasted for at least another week before finally the last assassin and the last target met and a winner was declared by Judge Mechner. This is all in 1987. You really can't have a game where kids shoot each other on a school grounds anymore. You probably don't want to have them doing anything to each other in some sort of organized hunting. In a world of cell phones and texting and GPS, I'm not 100% sure any of this would even feel the same. I'm sad that people won't experience it quite that way again. But that unique one-off experience is one of my strongest memories of what David did for me. In my senior year, 1988, David wasn't quite as present as he had been before. There were ways to take classes very quickly, and David had taken them all, until he was down to one credit and one class that he had left remaining to take. 
and he had chosen Reading Unlimited, a class I was also taking. It was a very strange class to take, looking back at it. You had to read a book in about six days. So about every week and a half, you would meet with your assigned teacher, talk about the book you had just read one-on-one -on -one for about an hour, and then write a small report on what you had thought of the book, just so they had a record. That was David's one remaining class, which meant he only had to be on school grounds for about an hour every six days of classes. But I kept track of him. He traveled off to Japan. He became a Go player, training under some true masters. After that, he moved back to New York, started working in artificial intelligence and a whole other range of fields of study that I think were better for having him be a part of them. Meanwhile, something else had happened during the time of assassination and Reading Unlimited. Working on his Arabian Nights game, which had become Prince of Persia, Jordan Mechner had decided to use rotoscoping, where he would take films or videos of people moving and then trace them over on a computer to be able to provide more realistic movements. He had people in his social circle who filmed themselves being the princess or the vizier, and for the part of the protagonist, he had enlisted David. They, in fact, had gone to Horace Greeley High School with a camera and filmed David wearing an Arabian Nights costume climbing up around the school, running around the parking lot, going up walls, and this footage was what was used for the game. When you see your character in Prince of Persia clamber up a wall, he's climbing up a retention wall near the gym at Horace Greeley High School. When you see him running back and forth and slipping, he's running back and forth inside of a parking lot. It was this extra little bit of craft, I think, that made Prince of Persia so special. You felt like you were moving a real person inside of the computer, and it looks brilliant, even to this day. But that's David in the machine. The next time that I ever dealt with any of the Mechners was around the time that Prince of Persia needed to be rescued from Apple II discs. Jordan knew of me because I had known David in high school. We hadn't really interacted. So it was using that link that Jordan had reached out and asked me if I would help. In the years hence, we've seen each other in person a couple times, mostly involving computer games or being at a social event for his family. But that's how it all started. This relationship that I've had with Prince of Persia ever since, being known for being one of the people who rescued Prince of Persia from the sands of time, that was because of my friend, David. It is a fascinating world out there. There are so many ways to derive joy from how people interact, but there's only a very small number of people who I think at the age of 16 could organize a multiplayer game using squirt guns and school hallways and make it all get pulled off. It takes not just a standard level genius, but a comfort with people of socializing, with what we now call community building. It was nice when I was so young to bump into somebody with all those capabilities because they became goals for me. And as I put together games or events or made calls for people to assemble, to volunteer, to make something better, to be a part of something, I took inspiration from the games of the Mechners. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Forrest Fuqua, Mark Pilgrim, James Bakoyanu, Scott McGrady, Scott Roseanne, and Joshua Stein, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt.